I will invite you to stand as you are able as we join in a time of confession. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, the God of manna, the God of miracles, the God of mercy. Amen. Drawn to Christ in seeking God's abundance, let us confess our sin. God, our provider, help us. It is hard to believe there is enough to share. We question your ways when they differ from the ways of the world in which we live. We turn to our own understanding rather than trusting in you. We take offense at your teachings and your ways. Turn us again to you. Where else can we turn? Share with us the words of eternal life and feed us for life in the world. Amen. Beloved people of God, in Jesus, the manna from heaven, you are fed and nourished. By Jesus, the worker of miracles, there is always more than enough. Through Jesus, the bread of life, you are shown God's mercy. You are forgiven and loved into abundant life. Amen. In our first reading, Joshua has gathered the Israelites at Shechem, an important religious shrine for the later northern kingdom, and they're gathered there to renew the covenant, which was part of the instructions that God gave to Moses and the people at Mount Sinai. And this particular occasion follows a period of time where, after finally reaching the Promised Land, The Israelites haven't had the best track record of living into this covenant relationship with God. And yet, despite their failings, in this moment of grace, Joshua invites the people to have another chance to choose who they will serve. A reminder that God never forces relationship upon us, that it's a gift we are free to choose. Let us listen to the word. Joshua gathered all the tribes of Israel at Shechem. He summoned the elders of Israel, its leaders, judges, and officers. They presented themselves before God. Then Joshua said to the entire people, This is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. Long ago, your ancestors lived on the other side of the Euphrates. They served other gods. Among them was Terah, the father of Abraham and Nahor. So now, revere the Lord. Serve him honestly and faithfully. Put aside the gods that your ancestors served beyond the Euphrates and in Egypt and serve the Lord. But if it seems wrong in your opinion to serve the Lord, then choose today whom you will serve. Choose the gods whom your ancestors served beyond the Euphrates or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you live. But my family and I will serve the Lord. Then the people answered, God forbid that we ever leave the Lord to serve other gods. The Lord is our God. He is the one who brought us and our ancestors up from the land of Egypt, from the house of bondage. He has done these mighty signs in our sight. He has protected us the whole way we've gone and in all the nations through which we've passed. The Lord has driven out all the nations before us, including the Amorites who lived in the land. We, too, will serve the Lord because he is our God. Hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. Thanks Thanks be be to to God. God. For our gospel acclamation this morning, we'll be using the same one that we used this summer when we did service of the word. So for those who'd like to find it in the book, it's small numbers at the front, number 216. And I'll invite you to stand as you are able.
The Holy Gospel according to John, the sixth chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in them and I, in me and I in them. As the living Father sent me, and I live because of the Father, so whoever eats me lives because of me. This is the bread that came down from heaven. It isn't like the bread your ancestors ate and then they died. Whoever eats this bread will live forever. Jesus said these things while he was teaching in the synagogue in Capernaum. Many of his disciples who heard this said, This message is harsh. Who can hear it? Jesus knew that the disciples were grumbling about this, and he said to them, Does this offend you? What if you were to see the human one going up where he was before? The spirit is the one who gives life, and the flesh doesn't help at all. The words I have spoken to you are spirit and life, yet some of you don't believe. Jesus knew from the beginning who wouldn't believe and the one who would betray him. He said, For this reason I said to you that none can come to me unless the Father enables them to do so. At this, many of his disciples turned away and no longer accompanied him. Jesus asked the twelve, Do you also want to leave? Simon Peter answered, Lord, where would we go? You have the words of eternal life. We believe and know that you are God's holy one. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise Praise to you, O Christ. Please be seated. So today we wrap up a five-week exploration of Jesus' Bread of Life teaching. It began a few weeks ago with Jesus miraculously feeding this huge crowd with just five loaves of bread and two fish. And then we have had this long teaching that came after the sign where Jesus tries to explain what that miracle was intended to teach that he himself is the bread and the blood that gives life to those who receive it. And by the end, which is what we get today, we get the end of this whole long section, what we see is that not everyone is able to receive or accept Jesus' claims that he is the bread of life. Many of the disciples wonder out loud, this teaching is difficult, it's harsh. Who can accept it? And for many, as we see, the teaching was simply too harsh, too difficult, too offensive to accept. They had what we might call a crisis of faith, where they simply couldn't reconcile this teaching with what they thought Jesus should be. And so many of them, many of the disciples did turn back and no longer went about with Jesus. I don't know, have you ever had a crisis of faith? Maybe would you use that language? I can still remember, oh, I would say it's my first, it might not be my first, but the one that stands out, um, my big crisis of faith, was when I was in my undergraduate studies. Um, In my undergraduate degree, I majored in religious studies, and so I was taking courses on all different religions, but I especially loved taking courses about Christianity and Judaism so I could learn more about the history and background of the Bible because I was raised as a Christian, and it really was important to me to learn as much as I could about this tradition. But the thing is, what I discovered is that studying the Bible and Christianity from an academic perspective challenged a lot of what I was taught growing up in Sunday school and confirmation and church, those things that I learned as a child and a teenager. And three years into my degree, I can still clearly remember having that moment of what I now call a crisis of faith. And that summer, after my third year of university, I was working, as I had for several summers, at a Lutheran Bible camp in northern Saskatchewan. I was the waterfront supervisor, and one of my duties was cleaning out the sauna. Every week they had a wood-fired sauna, so I had to make sure it was swept out and wiped down and all of that. 
And I remember being in that location, right, I can still visualize it, and having this sinking feeling of maybe I had actually lost my faith. As I had no clue how to bring together those, those pieces, all that really interesting information and history that I was learning in university, spending my summers with all of these faithful Lutherans, many of whom did seem to have things figured out or feel confident in their faith and what they believed. And I didn't know how to bring those things together, how to make them work. I had so many questions and doubts about my faith. And I still, in my heart, I wanted to believe, but I just wasn't sure if maybe I did anymore because somewhere along the way, I'd come to understand that doubts and faith couldn't sit together. And I know I've shared this conversation here before, so some of you might have heard this story, um, but there was a conversation that helped me move through this crisis. That fall, after the summer, I was back at my lifeguarding job at the YMCA in Regina, um, and I was on a break and having a conversation with a fellow guard who was a few years older than me and who was also studying, um, well, he was studying at Bible College to be a pastor in the Alliance Church. And I remember feeling a little bit fearful, um, probably ashamed, <laughs> to admit out loud that I was having doubts about God and faith, so I probably said something like, it's not that I doubt God. But my friend interrupted me and said something like, why not? I doubt God all the time. And in that moment, his ability to name that out loud for me was so freeing to hear those words. To know that there is this person here that I respect, who I know takes his faith seriously, he's studying to be a pastor himself. If he could have doubts about his faith, then maybe I was going to be okay too. Doubt, as I have learned, and from that moment that was the starting point for me, doubt is not the opposite of faith. I was reminded of that truth again more recently by Pastor Nadia Boltz Weber. Um, she's written several books. She's an ELCA, so a Lutheran pastor in the United States. Um, she's not serving a congregation anymore these days. She's kind of a public theologian, she calls herself, and she does a lot of writing. Um, I get her emails in my inbox, I don't know, weekly, or I know, Lori, you do too. Um, and there was one a few weeks back that, um, stood out to me. She was responding to a woman who was struggling with a recent medical diagnosis. And I'm going to share a quote from her, and I'll just note that she sometimes uses some colorful language, and there is one of those colorful words in this, uh, this quote, but I want to use her words because I think she captures it well. So she says, I'm not sure at what point it was decided that having faith looks like an unwavering and changeless belief in God, no matter what kind of shitstorm we're in the midst of. I'm also not sure we were created to be quite that boring. She goes on, I've mentioned it before, but the opposite of faith isn't doubt. The opposite of faith is certainty. The opposite of faith isn't doubt. The opposite of faith is certainty. Standing here this morning, some 20 years after that crisis of faith that I shared about, I am most certainly okay. I have been able to come to that place where I know that I don't need to have all the answers, and most days I'm okay with that. I'll tell you, that was a struggle through seminary, too. I kind of thought I'd get through seminary and be ready to lead a congregation with all the answers for you. Doesn't happen. <laughs> it didn't happen at seminary. That's, that's not the reality of faith, right? We don't ever have all of the answers. And when there are those who are really certain that they do, we ought to be suspicious of that. I know for me a lot of what had to do with being okay is that what I've come to see is that a lot of the time I stand with Simon Peter. In our story, when Jesus asks his 12, do you also wish to go away? Simon Peter, 
Again, he was one too who had his great moments and his not so great moments, but here is one of those moments that I think is good for us to emulate. He answers, Lord, to whom can we go? You have the words of eternal life. As we grow up, and if you think back through your faith journey, maybe you can identify these moments in your life. As we grow up, especially as we move into adulthood, we naturally start to question a lot of what was taught to us as children. And that is good. We, we ought to be doing that. It's good to question and to continue thinking about those things. But it's hard. It's really hard work. And a lot of folks end up choosing to leave religion behind at that stage in life, often because our churches are not always a really great place to help people ask those hard questions. The church isn't always a place that allows room for doubts and questions. So I think that in large part is why if people haven't had that space, it's easier to just leave it behind. For those who do stay or those who return at some later point, I think we often come back to God because not because we have all the answers and have it figured out, not because we haven't been tempted also maybe to turn back and go another way. Again, maybe we have and we're coming back. What draws us back, I think, is because like Peter, there's something within us that has said, Lord, where else can we go? To whom else can we go? So I'll be up front with you after we've worked through these five weeks of this bread of life teaching. Even with my years of seminary training, I still can't say that I fully understand what Jesus is talking about. The disciples have it right. This is a difficult teaching. It's a really hard one, not just to maybe understand. There's some pieces that even feel kind of offensive, that rub up against something that it's just hard to, to accept everything that Jesus is saying. But I also do strongly believe that that is part of the point. Because if we look at the beginning of John's gospel, there's a clue for us. At the very beginning, Jesus calls his disciples to come and see. When they ask, what's, what's all this about? He says, come and see. And for me, that is what has been an important measure or gauge of my faith. Do I still want to come and see? I might not have it all figured out. I don't need to have it all figured out right now. But having that desire, that curiosity, that openness, even if I'm not sure, to come and see, that is where there is that space for faith to be, to exist and to grow. At the end of the day, I know for me, in spite of doubts or questions I continue to have, that is one thing I feel pretty certain about, that I do want to come and see. I want to be a part of what Jesus offers in our world, in our life, that way of love, even when it's not an easy path. Because Along the way, I've already had moments where I've experienced how abundant life with God can be. And I want more of that. I want to be a part of living in the world the way Jesus has shown us we can live together. It's not always the easy path, though. For Simon Peter and the disciples and for us, the way with Jesus will be filled with both blessing and hardship, with joy and with pain. But Jesus promises that this is the way that leads to abundant life. And I'm here for that, even when I don't fully understand it. And I hope that you are too. Amen. Our hymn of the day is a good uh, old traditional hymn, number 618, Guide Me Ever, Great Redeemer. And as we sing, I will invite you to stand as you are able.
in the last, well, it's, I'm trying to think how long ago it was that our new hymnal supplement, All Creation Sings, came out. And just recently, we did get a new box of these hymnals, and um, they're out in the pew, so we're hoping we have enough now for everyone. But because we've had um, new ones come, a box of, I think it's 24 or so, and I wanted to mention, too, they've, um, by donation, uh, about half of them came from donations that were given in memory of Linda Anger. And then Haida Emmerich also um, donated several copies in honor of, I think, some other folks, but also our 190th anniversary. So um, we're very thankful for those gifts. And we wanted to take some time in our worship this morning to bless these new books for our use. They're already in the pew, so what I'm hoping is that you can move as you would like to, but to find one copy, so these ones, and I'll invite you to hold it. If they're not all being touched, that's okay, right? God's blessing doesn't depend on our, um, our physical touch. But this is just a prayer to give thanks for this gift and um, to pray that there'll be a blessing for us in our worship as a community. So I invite you to pray with me. Gracious God, we give you thanks for the gift of music and for the blessing that music is in the life of our congregation. We thank you for this new resource for all creation sings, for the gift of the songs that are in this book, um, these beautiful new hymns that speak to our world, to our faith in this time in more contemporary ways. We thank you for the ways that this hymnal has already been a blessing in our worship and pray that it would continue to, to do so. We ask for your love to be upon these particular books. We give you thanks for the gifts that have been given to make it possible for us to have these and we pray that as we worship with them, that they would be a blessing to our community and to each one of us in our walk of faith. We pray all of this and this blessing in the name of Jesus. Amen.